It's funny, the last time I was on this stage was exactly 10 years ago when we uh, did the laughter, the year of laughter, for the 20th anniversary, we did the year of laughter. And I was doing a uh, Jewish joke slap down with Simon Shama. You could look it up. <laughs> this is my great friend Riva here. I assume there are people out there right now, you're just one giant blinding light. <laughs> Which is better for my nerves. <sighs> Mr. Weschler. Yes, yes, May Ms. I Blair. call you Ren? You may. <laughs> you have written one truly remarkable book. Um, I don't think I've ever read a portrait of a friendship that is both um, of such satisfying quality as a piece of writing and as confounding and amazing as a tour through a friendship. And um, one wonders, how did this marvel come about? <laughs> well, thank you. Um, it's an interesting story. Uh, many of you have in your mind that you first heard about Oliver Sacks when his great masterpiece, Awakenings, came out. Um, this is not true, uh, because nobody heard about that book for over 10 years after it was published. Um, <laughs> He, that book was published in 1973 to universal contempt and disdain, especially in the medical community. Uh, it, had not been, it had not gone through the appropriate channels. Well, first of all, how many of you know the basic story of Awakenings? Uh, if I asked how many read, you, read it, how many would say not personally? Uh, but, but let me do, give you a quick story about what it was about. Um, as many of you know, there was after World War I an absolutely horrendous influenza outbreak uh, that killed more people than the war itself had. In the three months after World War I, 20 million people died of this influenza, some very great people and just all kinds of wonderful people. Um, of those who survived, uh, several years later, and especially to very young people, people uh, in their 20s and 30s, at the outset of their careers. Uh, one by one, at first privately, and unaware that this was happening all over the place, uh, in the middle of their vivid day, they would suddenly come to a... Stop. <laughs> um, it was called sleepy sickness. It was as talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, in its day as AIDS is today. It lasted for about five or six years. These people, ten, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands all over the world, would at first be being taken care of by their families, uh, and then the families couldn't do it anymore, and they were warehoused. All over the world, there were places that were founded called Homes for the Incurable. The one that Oliver Sacks would come to years later still had that over the little pe lintel piece. Amazingly, uh, as soon as people stopped having it, uh, uh, it was just forgotten. It was repressed. And so you had these homes for the curable that were filled with these living statues. Uh, and gradually many of them died and they were replaced by standard issue catatonics and, and, and variously demented and extreme Parkinsonian so that they were just a general population. Um, years later, Oliver Sacks uh, uh, well, I should tell you a little bit about Oliver Sacks, too. Oliver Sacks had been born in 1933 in England. He's part of this astonishing class of 1933. I've often thought about this class. These are people who, if you think about it, emerge from World War II on the brink of, if, if they emerge at all, on the brink of puberty and have certain wild uh, characteristics. I mean, Susan Sontag, Philip Roth, Roman Polanski. Uh, there's a whole group of these people. That My were, mother. <laughs> by the way, talk about great books. Wait till you see her book next year, Golem, which I've read a lot about her mother, and she's absolutely one of these people. Um, anyway, um, so he's born, the family is a family of doctors. Her, his mother uh, is the first it's an Orthodox Jewish family. His mother's the first uh, female surgeon in England, and a, uh, uh, an OBGYN doctor. 
His father is a general practitioner. Um, and he has t uh, three older brothers. Two of them are also doctors, are going to be doctors. And it's clear to them that this late arrival, his mother was 38 when she had him, uh, was obviously some kind of prodigy, but they didn't have a clue what to do with him. Uh, his mother, for example, from right at the beginning, as bedtime stories, would read stories from her favorite author, D.H. Lawrence. <laughs> One of those special Orthodox Jewish families. Uh, no effect on it at all. <laughs> <laughs> when he was eight years old, not knowing what else to do, she would bring home uh, stillborn fetuses for him to dissect. When he was 12, she took him along to, a, uh, dis to an autopsy of a 12-year-old boy who had committed suicide. He also had, had a terrible, terrible time uh, during the Battle of Britain. All the children of London were evacuated, but especially children of two doctors. And in his case, they were so consumed in their doctoring that they didn't notice the place he, he and his slightly older brother had been sent to was a hellhole, a uh, Dickensian hellhole, where he was regularly beaten, I suspect sexually abused. Um, his older brother, who had just gone into puberty, was destroyed and emerged a, a broken schizophrenic and lived in the attic in his father's house by the time I would go see him. Uh, Oliver reconstituted himself through love of periodic table and numbers, but he was quite eccentric. He then had some wonderful junior high school experiences with classmates like Jonathan Miller the, from Beyond the Fringe. Uh, Eric Korn, who was one of the great antiquarian book dealers and, and had a column in the TLS, L, TLS, all kinds of interesting people. In any case, um, very, very quickly, when, when uh, he is 20, his father says, why don't you bring home any girlfriends? And he says, and uh, why don't, do you not like girls? Do you like boys? And he says, Father, I'm a homosexual. Please don't tell mother. It would kill her. And the next morning, she came tearing down the stairs and absolutely tore into him for three hours. This is the person he's closest to in the world. Three hours of deuteronomical cursing, as he put it, filth of the bowel, abomination. I wish you had never been born. He goes on to medical school. By the way, he, he ghost wrote two years later. By the way, first of all, she falls silent for about a month. And when they start talking again, it's never mentioned again. A few years later, he ghost writes her book, a best-selling book on menopause. But you have to say what it was that he commented about the oh, female oh, yeah. anatomy. Oh, oh yeah. He, he said, he said uh, Yes, I, I wrote that book despite the fact that then and ever after, notwithstanding my going to medical school, I had absolutely no idea, and I have absolutely no idea what they have down there. <laughs> um, but it was a best-selling book, Women of 40. Uh, he said you can recognize a certain felicity of style. Um, in any case, however, the pressures were just building up, and. Uh, as soon as he had finished his medical school and some residencies in England, he, like a bat, bat out of hell, he fled England and went directly to the West Coast, to San Francisco. Uh, and he then, for the next five years, first as a resident in San Francisco and then in Los Angeles, had this absolutely wild sexual liberation. Uh, he was an extraordinary bodybuilder. He was... In, on the edges of Hell's Angels as a motorcyclist, where they called him Dr. Squat because he was also the California State heavyweight lifting champion. Um, uh, and he took, so he had a, a natural sexual life and, and prodigious amounts of drugs, but absolutely insane amounts of drugs. He would, uh, on a Friday evening in Los Angeles, make a milkshake, which would have 10 times the amount of, of speed that would kill you. Uh, actually, 20 times the amount of speed that would yeah. kill you. <laughs> have I mentioned he got, he was, he he got he, close to it more he, than once, yeah. yeah. And, he, and he was extremely strong, so he, but he would get on his motorcycle, he would motorcycle up to Crater Lake and back without stopping except for gas. <laughs> Uh, get like the 1,500 like mile yeah. round trip, yeah. 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 Anyway, um, and then 
uh, he looked at himself in the mirror one day and he said, if I keep this up, I'm going to be dead uh, in six months. And he basically, it's a little bit longer than this, but he basically quit both sex and drugs cold turkey. By the time I saw him, he had been celibate for 15 years when I first saw him. So very quickly, um, he comes back to New York to Albert Einstein. He wants to be a bench scientist, but he's incredibly clumsy. This was a characteristic he had regularly with us. Uh, I had many times going on trains with him in England where he would accidentally pull the door off its hinges. Uh, he was strong and clumsy. Um, but a great in, combination. <laughs> now calm down. <laughs> but uh, but he, uh, he, by the way, I should say, I have an amazing photograph of him in his bodybuilding days. And if you come to the book signing, you don't even have to buy a book, I'll show it to you. It's on my, she saw it. It's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing? Uh, Michelangelo would have been slavering. <laughs> <laughs> I call it Oliver and his Tom of Finland face. But anyway, uh, so, so, um, he was very clumsy. Uh, he would drop the hamburger into the centrifuge by accident. He, w he spent six months uh, pulling out of individual earthworms the myelin sheath of surrounding their neur neural, uh, the neurons. And uh, he had six months worth, which was like a cup, and he accidentally lost it. But it was okay, because he had all his notes. So he went back to... Uh, to Greenwich Village where he was staying and, and put them on the back of his motorcycle and they went flying off the motorcycle on the Cross Bronx Expressway and, that was, and then they basically said, get out of here, go, go deal with patience. And he was sent to this place uh, called, uh, well, it, it was one of these homes. This is 66. By 67, he had begun to notice that some of these patients were not like the others. There were 500 of them warehoused at this place. Um, and he said, some of these are different. And he eventually selected out 80 of them that seemed different to him. Not only were they different, these were these living statues, but he had the appalling, the harrowing realization or, or intuition that they were all completely alive inside. They hadn't talked for 30 years. Um, a few years later, just to place me in this, this is 1969, which is when I first arrived at college. Uh, and in the summer of 1969, uh, a new drug had appeared. He gives the drug, it's L-DOPA, to these patients. And they had this absolutely astonishing awakening. And just a glorious springtime in the summer of 69 for about four, four weeks where they're completely... In every sense. In every sense. Physically awake, talk. mentally, yeah. socially. Years later, I, I asked one, I had occasion to ask one of them. Ten years later, I was hanging out with Oliver, and, I, and there was one of them, uh, uh, Gussie, in the book, and I said to her, she was kind of slumped over, and I said, do you remember what it was like when you first came to? And she said, oh, yes. And I said, what was it like? And she said, suddenly, I was talking. And I said, do you remember your first words? Oh, yes. What, what, what were your first words after 30 years of silence? I said, ooh, I'm talking. <laughs> anyway, they then went into a terrible period where they had horrendous side effects. This was against the orthodoxy of the medical community in those days. L-DOPA, this drug, was supposed to be a messianic cure for Parkinsonism, and there were no side effects, and he was seeing extreme side effects, a period of tribulation where it was like bedlam. And then the, of the ones who survived, most of them survived, they went into a period of accommodation after that, where they, it wasn't as bad as tribulation, but it was nowhere near as good as awakening, and lived out their life like that. Um, a few years later, in 1973, his mother died, or 1972, 73, his mother dies, he, uh, and he decides he's going to write Awakenings, the book, partly in tribute to her. It consists of 20 amazing case studies. It is an absolutely Melvillian book. It is one of the great, great books of the, of the last half of the 20th century in any category. 
Uh, but as I say, it is just ignored because Auden loves it, Frank Kermode loves it, people like that. But among doctors, they just don't believe it because it does, it's not quantitative. It, there was not double blind. It wasn't put through uh, peer review. It's case studies, which are by definition anecdotal. Nobody believes that the way medicine was being done in those days, was, everything was quantitative. It was mass population studies, you know, and, and this was not that. And so it was just basically ignored, dismissed. In any case, he was quite crushed. A few years later, um, he takes a walk. Um, in kind of his despair, he goes on an idiotic walk by himself on the cliffs over the fjords in Norway and has a confrontation with a bull, or as almost all his friends are sure, a cow. <laughs> <laughs> in any he case, and it's that. not clear to what extent it was a confrontation, but he went off the cliff, he falls hundreds of feet, he has a terrible leg accident. Uh, he would have died except for some farmers were walking by and he's eventually rushed back to the hospital that he had been an intern at uh, in London. Um, and he has a series of extreme neurological uh, sequels. Uh, it's, sure, it's broken, but he is convinced that it's not his. He, his very, he, he at one point, is this doughy mass that's in his bed. He tries to throw it out He throws it out, and, and he goes following out. To onto the floor. Yeah. As I told you, he's very strong. And, and, uh, and he... Um, um, in any case, uh, uh, so, he's, uh, so he decides he's going to write a book about that. Um, and he is then stuck in a 10-year-long writer's block, which, by the way, took the form of graphomania. He was writing millions of words, just not the right words. Now, going back to me, uh, weirdly, I had read the book. The reason I had read the book is because I went to Santa Cruz in its kind of glory days of strangeness. And uh, as I was graduating, uh, my philosophy teacher, Maurice Natanson, hurled, it was 1974, he hurled the book in my chest, almost broke my ribs. He said, read this. And he kind of had the voice of God, and you did what he said. I graduated and kind of hid from that assignment for a while. But when I did read it, um, I wrote Oliver a letter. So we're now in 1979. Um, and Oliver, uh, the letter I wrote in its entirety said, uh, said in the book, Awakenings, uh, you call the place Mount Carmel, and I get it, um, a Dark Night of the Soul, um, uh, St. John of the Cross, but, th but this book seems much more Kabbalistic, much more Jewish mystical than Christian mystical. Am I wrong? And oh, was that the right question to ask him? Um, I got back an eight page, well, it took about six months because he lost the letter, then he found the letter, then he wrote the reply, then he lost the reply, then he bailed the reply. But, Are you but, sensing a theme here? <laughs> and uh, the letter he wrote back was, well, as a matter of fact, the place is called Beth Abraham. My parents were Orthodox Jewish. Uh, the, uh, my first cousin is Abba Iban, the Israeli foreign minister. We share another first cousin who was Al Cap of Little Abner fame. <laughs> These three were first cousins of each other. Footnote, uh, Jules Pfeiffer, Roy Cohn, and Dick Morris are first cousins of each other. It's true what they say about those people. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but, but in any case, um, he said that his greatest hero was a Soviet neuropsychologist named A.R. Luria. For all he knew, he was related to Luria, the author of the Zohar, one of the founding documents of the, of the Kabbalah and so forth. So we began corresponding. Uh, very quickly, I, at that point, was writing my first book, um, which was, I'd spent three or four years hanging out with a California artist named Robert Irwin. And I wrote a book called Seeing is Forgetting the Name of the Thing One Sees, otherwise known as Seeing is Forgetting the Name of the Book I Meant to Buy. <laughs> but, 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 uh, but the incredible thing about it was, uh, this is uh, perhaps not surprising to you here in Chicago, but I submitted it around 1979 to six or seven New York publishers and got rave rejections. 
Every single one of them wanted to publish my next book, but not this one, because 1980, there was no way they could possibly publish a book about a California artist. Things have changed just a little bit. For California, but not necessarily for Chicago. Yeah, for that not matter. Chicago's where? The same problem. What? Yeah. yeah. What, where is that? Anyway, but, but, uh, but uh, so I got very lucky. It was bought by the New Yorker, which brought me to New York. So I'm 29 years old at this point, and I'm looking for another story. And I've been corresponding with Oliver, and I decide to go out and see whether he might be the person to talk to. I have to emphasize, he was a recluse. He was in the middle of this down-spiraling uh, writer's block. So we were about the six-year point on that at that point. And this is when you go to visit him on City Island? Yeah, that's he's right. Living, so he, he, he's, he's living on City Island, which he lived down for quite a while yeah. before moving in. But there's so, some incredible passages. Yes, yeah, well, maybe about, I'll read, I'll, I'll read, yeah, read the, Should I read, read the, the one row? about rowing? Oh, yes. That's, okay. It's really wonderful. So here we have, let's see where it is. Let's see if you can find that. Here it is, okay. So I go out to see him. He is church mouse poor. He's working at institutions and at uh, poor houses, the Little Sisters of the Poor, uh, Bronx State Hospital. Uh, he lives by himself on this little clapboard house. Uh, he really has very few friends, and he's just spending all his time writing this book that's never getting finished uh, and driving all his friends crazy. Um, but the, the first time I go out there, he says to me, uh, Oliver suddenly asked me, shall we go out for a row? Uh, we head out to the clapboard garage on the side of the little black yard, inside a series of oars lined along the wall, one of them with its handle shattered clean off. We, uh, I mentioned that he's, that's typical Oliver. Um, we pick up the oars and the oar grips and walk down toward the narrow beach at the nub end of the street. City Island is this little appendix that juts into Long Island Sound off the edge of the Bronx. Um, I roll up my dress slacks, Huck Finn style. The boat, a 15-footer, is moored upside down in a little sand alcove, the new key lock jammed with sand. Only a Jewish intellectual sax grumbles, wrestling with the mechanism, could get himself into such a fix. And yet we two Jewish intellectuals finally managed to free the thing. And soon we are out on the water with my notebook curled in my lap at the prow of the boat. I feel like a damsel with her parasol. Oliver pulling with a clean, steady rhythm as the boat slices out toward the open channel. Oliver proceeds to row for well over two hours, a continuous, steady rhythm, talking cheerfully all the while. A spangle of sweat soon appears on his brow, but not once does the conversation flag for breath. There is no change whatsoever in his breathing, despite the fact that such exercise would quickly exhaust anyone else I know. Um, and he proceeds to tell me about his days at Muscle Beach. Um, uh, mine was called the deadlift, and for good reason, it kills. And indeed, in time, I damaged a disc in my back. My legs were stronger than my back. My back wasn't weak. It was, too was very strong, only strong and vulnerable. We continue on out. The Empire State Building glistens in the distance on the far horizon to the south, a paperweight souvenir of itself. My, ne uh, my neighbor, uh, he goes on. Over there, he continues indicating over his shoulder is the Throg's Neck Bridge. This is my favorite swim, from the island out to the pylons and back, about six miles altogether. Two beats. Although it can get a bit hazardous, since the people in, the, in their motorboats don't normally expect swimmers in these waters. Two beats. Especially late at night. <laughs> A brief turn, a pause as he turns around, reconnoitering our drift. Swimming runs in the family, he goes on. My father loves to swim. The poor man's equivalent of crossing the English Channel was a 15-mile course off the Isle of Wight, a race for which he has held succession of records by decile for swimmers in their 20s, 30s, 40s, their 60s, and currently for swimmers in their 90s. And your mother, I ask? My mother was not so much into swimming, two beats. She held several English records in the standing long jump. <laughs> 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 
Anyway. Just your average Jewish family. <laughs> um, by the way, uh, years later, there was, this is not Hurricane Sandy, there was a hurricane that went right over Manhattan and, and then into Long Island Sound and right over uh, City Island. And he called me the next day, exultant. He had refused to evacuate. There was a hurricane party on his little nub of a block. And in, when, when the, uh, yeah, you like this one? <laughs> the wall of the hurricane goes by, and now they're in the eye of the storm. And he immediately says, oh, I've got to go swimming. So he goes swimming in the eye of the storm, surrounded by tropical butterflies, because the storm has hoovered them up the coast. But he miscalculates his return. He's 30, 30 feet away from the shore when the other wall hits. And suddenly the boulders in, in the water become like popcorn. And he emerges, and he's completely bruised everywhere, for which he's exultant. He's very excited about having accomplished that um, and tells me the story the next day. Anyway, just to, to finish, uh, I talked to Mr. Sean, uh, the editor of The New Yorker, and this is the old New Yorker. Uh, he gave me permission to start working on what would become a, what was to be a three-part profile, the kind they used to do, probably 100,000 words, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, it was about an unknown neurologist, but that was the old New Yorker. And anyway, I proceeded to work on it. I mean, we, we had incredible times. We, I went on rounds with him regularly. I went to, uh, to London and to California. I interviewed everybody. I had done four years of work. I'd gone off, and, and just as he was beginning to finish his goddamn book, which all of us were working to help him finish it toward the end, that process, by the way, consisted of you know taking 100,000 words, reducing it to 20,000 words. Oh, you should see. And then there, I would say to him, your editor's done a beautiful job. You just need 500 words right here, just 500 words. And the next morning, he'd deliver 50,000 words with a happy smile on his face. And just, but finally, we did that. He, for his part, once it had been sent to the printers, uh, proceeded the next day to break his other leg. His editor in, in, in London sent him a wonderful telegram. Oliver, you would do anything for a footnote. <laughs> anyway, but I figured it was time for me to, to go off and, and index my notes. Uh, took two months. The index was 250 pages. I started writing. I was a good 30,000, 40,000 words into the writing. And he asked me to stop. It is astonishing to get to that point in the book. I mean, just as you're reading this book and you're seeing just the level of loving detail that you've gotten down and the, the flavor of all the conversations, you feel this sort of mass of absolutely charming material. It, it must have just been absolutely Well, we'll crushing. show There's a video about, we, we, we're, oh, we're gonna show let, that in a second. So, so let's get ready for the this video is something. in a second. But, but, uh, just to give you a little background here, we had a whole part of our conversations in those years was him very slowly revealing to me the ghastly fact, the blight of his life, that he was gay. And I was regularly saying, Oliver, nobody cares. <laughs> and, and he would say, you sound like my shrink. I should mention that when he, after he arrives in New York, he starts psychoanalysis and does two or three times a week for the next 50 years which is either an indication of a massive failure or an unbelievable success. I've never quite figured out in terms of... <laughs> but in any case, his shrink had said, you were the least affected by, by uh, gay love of anybody he, I know. And he had replied to both of us. He said, it's true, I live here in my cell, in my prison cell, the door blasted open, and I listened to the dancing out in the streets beyond, but I refused to leave. Uh, and. He hoped that his homosexuality hadn't blighted his science. He was sure it, he, was, he had worked very hard for it not to have done that. But the question was whether or not I could write the book without mention of that. Years later, uh, just before he died, a documentary was being made about his life. And, uh, and so I took part in that. And he and I, even though this happened, we stayed very close friends. Uh, for the rest of his life, and I was asked uh, by Rick Burns, the brother of Ken Burns, uh, to take him on a walk through the, through the uh, botanical gardens across the street from Beth Abraham. He was a huge lover of ferns, among many other sorts of passions. 
And he, uh, and so we went on a walk, we sat on a bench, and our conversation turned to why he'd asked me to stop at the moment he did, and that's when this video, uh, for about five minutes, this is an outtake from the film, but Rick was nice enough to let us use it. And the film will be uh, starting to circulate, it will be eventually on Modern Masters. It's called Oliver Sacks, My Own Life, but uh, maybe we can show this video. It's classic Oliver, when you would begin to get close to the nub of the issue, suddenly there'd be a fern or there'd be who knew what. The thing I was about to say at the point he interrupted me there was that it's not just that the drug experience had helped him to see that there might be life in those patients, but rather a wonderful, wonderful friend of his, uh, Bob Rodman, who was a resident with him in LA and became the biographer of Winnicott and was a psychoanalyst himself, said that Oliver was of the community of the refused and that he had extraordinary empathy, himself being uh, in the refused. Um, and uh, we'll keep going for a little more. Uh, and uh, uh, for the refused. And that has everything to do with his sexuality. So there was really way, no way to do it. But there was no, I wasn't going to out him. I mean, if he didn't want to be outed, and he said no. Well, it occurs to me that um, there are two ways that he was an outsider, uh, multiple ways, but on one level, the intensity and idiosyncratic nature of his intelligence often meant that people simply didn't understand him mm -hmm. and the nature of his passions. I mean, he wrote an entire book about his passion for ferns. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not many of us could pull that off. Um, but also, uh, so there's a level of not being understood, but then there's the level of hiding mm -hmm. and, you know, intentional withdrawal from uh, the chance to be understood. Mm -hmm. So when I think about him um, with his patients, uh, the locked in postencephalitic patients, the way that um, I imagine those two things coming together to give mm -hmm. him a particular ability to see things that were covert that were non-apparent and, you know, were both in the realm of hard to understand and somewhat withdrawn. You have to realize how different he was from other neurologists. Most neurologists in the days when he was starting would, uh, you know, there'd be the warehouse, they would look at the chart, they'd say, they'd look at the patient, they'd say, okay, add two milligrams, you know, go on to the next patient and so forth. Oliver would spend hours with these people. Uh, there's a wonderful story early on, all the way when he was a medical student in, in England. There was Fazy the Selenese tree planter, as he put it, Selenese Sri Lanka. And this guy was in a uremic delirium. And Oliver went into that room. Everybody else was just staring, steering clear of that room. He was just delirious. He spent 36 straight hours with this guy. He described it as one of the great privileges of his life that after two or three hours, you begin to get the structure of the delirium, and then you can enter the delirium. The other doctors were going by, oh, there's Sachs again, you know, doing one of his crazy things. But he, well, one of the things that's interesting is, is that as we would go out about on rounds, uh, he would sometimes, I remember one day in particular when we were driving from Little Sisters in Brooklyn to Little Sisters in, in the Bronx, and he said, uh, I am a clinical ontologist. Now, you know, Epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge and belief, you know, and, and, and aesthetics is the philosophy of beauty. Ontology is the philosophy of being itself. You know, why is there something rather than nothing, you know? And, and he would say, I am a clinical ontologist. I am someone for whom the clinical question is, how are you? How do you be? That's why the book is called this, you know. Uh, he had another point, we talked about this backstage. Uh, he described his subject as the intersection of fate and freedom. And the journey from the it to the I. Yeah. And you were talking about how, how important that's been. In, yeah. Well, for me, I mean, I first encountered his work, um, I think just after college, so the very early 80s. And it was completely revelatory because up until then, I mean, I come from sort of a medically oriented family, um, I've always been interested in story, both written and visual, 
but all of the stories of people with disabilities and impairments that I had been familiar with were all centered around diagnoses and cure. So you would sort of identify this aberration and then the rest of the story was how do you get rid of the aberration. And what Sachs did, one of the many things he did, was to reveal his patients as um, fascinating, not just for medical reasons, but as people uh, who had um, dream lives, fantasy lives, personal lives, desires, revelations within their impairments that you could not have gotten to any other way. Basically, a poetics of being through impairment, and I had never seen that done. And that completely, for me, opened up, in fact, it opened up my portrait practice, mm -hmm. um, which would be not a direction one would suppose that one would go from reading case studies to becoming a portrait artist. But he did, I think, was the first major influence. On and I, I would guess in your case, I mean, you who have had dozens of operations up to that point, you were well, just, just you were fact. the one. And, and he, precisely as you say, he was interested, he, he, he used to say, I don't care about the disease the person have, has, I mentioned the person who has the disease. And, which is a huge difference in how practice was being done. In, uh, well, there's a great example of that in Migraine, where mm -hmm. he's talking about uh, Hildegard of Bingen. And Hildegard was a saint who had visions, and she also did drawings and paintings of her visions. And you can see in them what appear to be migraine scotomas and auras. auras and all these different things. Yeah. And other people had reduced that to, oh, you know, she wasn't really having religious visions, she's having sequelae of this impairment, and so we should discount her um, experiences. And he completely reversed that. He said, of all of the countless people who've ever had migraines, how many of them used it as a doorway to expanded consciousness and a deeper understanding or structure on the universe. Yeah. And for me, that completely sums up the difference between how a clinical neurologist would have approached someone like Hildegard and what he made of her yeah. story. It says he, he used to, uh, I've talked to many people who read his migraine book. He was forced by his publishers to add a after or an appendix on, on cures or on, on treatment. And he said, but the point of the book was people who had migraines who've read it said, God, I had no idea. It was such a privilege to have migraines, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and other people who've read it said, God, I wish I could have migraines, you know. And, 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 and uh, just generally this, this uh, I mean, uh, but the kind of doctor he was, for example, uh, we would go to, we're, we're gonna go on, uh, how much longer do we have all together? Okay, so we're, we're okay. Uh, I'm about to ask you a very important question. Yeah, right. But he, he would, for example, one of the nuns at the Little Sisters talked about a patient they had who had neuropathy of the fingers, which she could no longer feel, and she was desperate because she couldn't do the rosary beads. And Oliver went to the nun and said, would it be okay if we glued the rosary to a ruler? And the nun would just say, how would this Jewish guy come up with this idea? But that's exactly the kind of thing yeah. he, he would do all the time. It's also, we were talking backstage about how all the way up to very recently, there were many people who just don't, didn't believe him. He has huge issues yeah. of credibility because, you know, uh, these, these are such anecdotal stories and so forth and so on. They aren't the kind of regular thing. And about his reliability, I have whole kind of choruses of people talking about how he was, mm -hmm. he was in fact quite grandiose and mythomaniac uh, at some level with his own life, but he claimed it never affected his science, and I have nurses and nuns and so forth all agreeing with that. But the point, what people don't quite understand is that these narratives were the therapy. They weren't just exactly. telling the story. And the point is he would come to people who had been 30 years in warehouses, and who had been treated like its, who had been treated like objects. Yes, okay, adds a little bit more, take a little bit more down. And he would instead spend hours with them. By the way, he did 500 words, finger peck typed, on every patient he saw every day of his career. They were in the files. What he did but, was but, he gave people the meaning. Yeah, and what he did lives. was take people who were at extreme 
remove, the community of the refused. And another way of saying how are you is what's your story? And he would take people who hadn't had a story because they were being treated for so long as if they were just, you know, warehoused. And he, together, they would develop the story. They would make the patient up. He would, you know, he would try things, he would begin to draw them out, he would check them off against other case studies from the 19th century since nobody had done them in the 20th century. You know, and he would basically, together, they would come up with a story and the object would become a subject. And that was the genius of, of, of his work. Um, anyway, so you were gonna ask well, the audience no, a question. I'm just gonna, one last comment is just that he says explicitly something along the lines of wanting to give people, not only give them their stories, but to give them in such a form that they could own and then begin to write them themselves. Yeah. You know, not literally speaking, but, but a story that them. one can then use as a vehicle to go forward. That they were heroes. He would often say they are the Sinbads, you know, journeying to the outer, outermost, they were privileged and we are privileged to go with them. You know, this kind of attitude is just amazingly different. Anyway. So here's a very important question. Um, we can either do Q&A right now, although Ren has generously said that he will do lots of A if you queue up for his book out there, um, or just Q period. Um, or uh, he can read a wonderful passage about being on the set of Awakenings, uh, Oliver Sacks meets Robin Williams. And that is a hard thing to turn down. So let us see a show of hands. Q and A. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> Hit it, kid. Okay. So I'll just read for maybe five minutes now the, uh, this passage. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, I have to. That's not there. Okay. So the point of it is, uh, I'm going to find it here. Yeah. Uh, Oliver Sacks was. All was, I mean, after, uh, I should mention that after uh, he said, no, I shouldn't do it, uh, 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 but we stayed close friends. We were friends for the rest of his life. He became the godfather of my daughter, it was very important in her life. And I was re a regular reality check for him because he had no sense of popular culture whatsoever. So I'll begin. His love of Star Trek notwithstanding, he and Temple Grandin and my daughter would spend hours talking about data and whether data could have an emotional life. But anyway, uh, <laughs> he was clueless when it came to the rest of popular culture. One afternoon, for example, he took to regaling me about a recent patient, a one-time hippie who'd become stuck in time, forever harking back to his love for a particular band. Oliver couldn't remember the band's name. It was something he thought like the happy corpses. The Grateful Dead, I hazarded. <laughs> yes, exactly, The Grateful Dead. Um, another afternoon, he, he, by the way, became friends after that with Mickey Hart, uh, and they would spend weeks uh, discussing percusso neurological issues together. Another afternoon, I received a panicky phone call from Oliver in his City Island home. In a great hurry, he explained that there was suddenly renewed interest from Hollywood in making a film of Awakenings, and in fact, things had advanced to the point where they were sending over actors to meet with him, and one was headed over right this minute. In fact, oh no, he could see the limo rounding the bend onto his little side street, only he'd forgotten the name of the actor. He was going to be there any minute, and it was going to be terribly embarrassing. Calm down, I tried to dulcify him. Did he remember anything of what he'd been told about the actor in question? Well, he was being considered for the role of Leonard, the main patient character, and they told Oliver that he was famous for a film, oh God, what was it called? Taxi Cab? Robert De Niro, I hazarded. <laughs> That's it, he exulted. <laughs> thank you, thank you, he hung up. Anyway, so indeed it happened. There's whole sections of describing what the filming was like which I'll skip over, but it's, a lot of it's very interesting, very fun. Um, and uh, then uh, I'll just, we'll come to the opening night, which was a gala opening uh, just before Christmas. And Joanna and uh, my wife and I joined the legions of guests at the premiere at the Paris Theater in Manhattan, followed by a gala dinner in the nearby Pierre Hotel. The film proved surprisingly fine for a studio production. I think say nice things about it. Um, and, um, and then we're going on, and uh, uh, 
the end. Uh, so then we're walking from the theater over to the Pierre Hotel where there's gonna be a gala uh, banquet uh, uh, for the uh, raise money for the Tourette's Foundation. Um, Oliver was walking alongside me, glowing and confirming by way of a side whisper. Okay, I think I have this right. I kiss all the women and I shake hands with the men. I kiss all the women and I shake hands with the men. I said, that's fine, no, that's good. Um, and anyway, so we go to our table, there's assigned seating, and at our table is Penelope Ann Miller, who had played the love interest of the De Niro character um, during his brief awakening. And each place setting featured a corporate gift from the sponsor, Ralph Lauren or Calvin Klein or somebody, perfume for the women and eau de cologne for the men. Oliver, predictably, was starting to overheat. I should mention that first day when we went on the uh, rowing ride, I had at one point gone to his bathroom and in his bathtub, uh, he had three air conditioners facing the bathtub. He would regularly overheat and so he always was having to freeze himself. Anyway. So in this situation, he was starting to overheat, and so he unscrewed his bottle of eau de cologne and splashed them on his face. And then he did so again a few minutes later, and again a few minutes after that. Pre presently, he was actually pouring the stuff over his head, <laughs> soon having emptied a good half of the bottle. Robin Williams came ambling over to give Oliver a hug and was stopped cold a good <laughs> yard away by the wall of perfumed stench. <laughs> Whoa, he seemed to bounce off it. But then, perhaps gauging the situation, he grabbed the bottle and proceeded to pour the other half all over himself in madcap solidarity. <laughs> At one point, Miller, uh, Penelope Ann Miller got up to mill about and I asked Oliver how he'd liked her performance in the film. Two beats, confusion. She was in the film? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, a few quick thoughts. Uh, I mean, the book has all kinds of stuff about going on, on rounds with him and so forth. Um, and basically, the huge impact he had on the world. I mean, just to give one example, before he started writing about Tourette's, you know, uh, they didn't have a word for it. You know, it, you would see these people, and frankly, the word in those days was, he's having a spaz attack. Or he's a spaz, that kind of language, right? And I think we're about to be, I, I want okay, you not she's, she's to gonna, leave okay, without. So I'm, so I'm, okay, I'm going to just finish this point. He, today, you see somebody doing that, you say, that's Tourette's, you know, the same with deaf people, the same with Parkinson's, all those sorts of things. But the really big thing he had in people's lives, the really big thing, came clear as he was dying. Yes. This is Three months before he died, he asked me to write the book after all. <laughs> this is the result. But... Around that time, it was just around his birthday, his 82nd birthday, and people were giving him toasts. And the head of the Columbia Medical School in New York, the neurology department, got up and said that nowadays, fully 70% of the young doctors who are applying for residency in neurology uh, at Columbia mention Oliver Sacks in their essays. The biggest change he made is in the way neurology and a lot of medicine, you would say, as well, yes, is practiced. Yes, absolutely. So. Absolutely. Medical humanities. Too fast, but, but that's that, I guess. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you all for coming. The book is just wonderful.